They love you. They just can't stop talking. <laughs> Good morning, church. I'll just give you a minute. <laughs> we are going to pass the peace, I promise. As you make your way to your seats, carrying your coffee or beverage of choice, and finish purchasing your pumpkin bread that you will most likely eat during church, so you need to buy more on your way out. Nobody, nothing. I got nothing. All right. Are we good? We have some announcements. Where are my peeps? All right. Here we go. <laughs> Y'all are killing me. So if you come on in, get seated, get situated, just a little bit of family business to take care of. So good morning, welcome, we are glad you are here. Um, if you are a visitor among us or new to this community, I want to give an extra special welcome to you. My name is Michelle Vernon and I get to be the pastor here. So it's my joy to welcome you into this time of worship. We have just a few announcements and First, um, I've been forgetting to do this a lot, and I don't want you guys to miss an opportunity for your spirit. So on your seats, you'll see these little slips of paper, and part of our community's spiritual discipline is that every week we invite you to write down one way that God has blessed you this week. And we invite you to bring them forward during the offering, and we bring them as our sacrifice of praise. And at the end of the hour, they're collected up, we take them, they get typed up and posted to our webpage. And it's important because one, God is always worthy to be praised. There is always something that God is doing in our lives that we need to give thanks for. And so it reminds us to look, it reminds us to see that God is doing stuff in our life, even when it feels like maybe God's being silent or God is distant. God is at work and God is doing good things. And so we are faithful to that. But it's important because they get posted on our webpage and then they become a testimony to somebody who needs to hear and to see that God is good and that God is doing good things. And it helps them to believe that God is going to do good things for them. So the little slips start thinking about one way, just one little way that God has blessed you. And then on the flip side, we've been working through these questions about discipleship, and for a while they were the sermon series that we did. And so week to week when we gathered these questions up, that's what determined what we taught on that Sunday. But I would encourage you to keep writing those questions. They'll either get addressed in a newsletter. The Wednesday night um, study, midweek study, is basically a sermon study, and so we sort of rehash the scripture, and if there were any questions about the sermon. But if there are other questions that come up out of these, we'll sort of talk about them there too. And that has been really, really powerful and really um, a great discipleship tool in small communities. So think about that. That's those little slips of paper on your seat. Also, if you were here yesterday to help distribute for Food Pantry, thank you so very much. We had scouts, we had different members of the church, but I will confess my own bias. The sweetest picture in my whole life was, I mean, we're not a community with a lot of small children, but we got some good ones. And so Sophia and Ella Piper and Urban were here yesterday morning, and they, with so much joy and so much pride, loading those bags into people's cars, um, and it blessed the people in line. And, oh, Ella's, is, where's Ella Piper? I was going to make, she's hiding from me in the hall. She's like, I hear my name. I might be in trouble. Oh, she's sick? Okay. Aw. Okay. Lord, make Ella Piper well. Um, <laughs> Ella is this big and weighs about 20 pounds soaking wet holding a saddle. And so for her to be carrying a bag of produce to a car is a feat. And she... Just she and Sophia and Urban, it blessed my heart. I know it blessed the heart of the people there. And so it isn't about how many we have. It's what we're raising them and who we're raising them to be. And so kudos, mom and dads and aunts and uncles and church family that have raised them in the way. So thank you for being here and being part of our food pantry. Coming up this week on Sunday, we have our trunk or treat from 5 to 7. Here is the clipboard. I'm going to give it to Laura first. Laura, stand up and wave at everybody. Laura's been in charge. You don't want to disappoint Laura. Sign up. Um, <laughs> Laura, why can, Laura, can you cry on command? No, just kidding. Uh, 
<laughs> sign up either to help hand out hot dogs, to help hand out popcorn, bring your card, donate candy, all of those things. There are lots of ways to engage and to be part of the community. It's a great time, um, so come be a part of that. We have a ton, like more than a thousand shares on Facebook, so know that we're expecting the community to turn out, so we need our community to turn out and make that a beautiful time. And we've got some extra candy. We've also had the wisdom of our college media office team send out a text to me and say, hey, what about kids who can't have candy? So we have made allotments for that. I would have never thought about that. What do you mean they can't have candy? Uh, <laughs> but apparently, there are some who can't. So we have taken care of that, and we will have some of those goodie bags at the cars to help distribute as well. So just come, be part of the community, be part of the ways that we reach the kids in our neighborhood to bless them in the name of Jesus. We are still continuing to pray for our community at 2 p.m. every day. If you are one of those people that have um, sent me an email and said you officially want to be on that email list, I occasionally send out focused prayer requests. Um, you can pray however you want to, but I'm asking you to pray for the life and the health and the vitality and the future and the vision of our church, that God is stirring something up and that we're going to be in discernment and unity together about how we move forward, and part of that is praying together. So if that's not something you have started doing yet or it's the first you're hearing of it, I invite you to start today. Every day, 2 p.m., we chose 2 o'clock because the Acts 2 chapter talks about what it means to be a healthy and vital church that believes in the power of God, the power of prayer, what happens when community gathers, what happens when we devote ourselves to the apostles' teaching and to each other and to fellowship and the breaking of bread. So 2 p.m., join us in praying. Just a quick breath prayer. It doesn't have to be anything elaborate. But on the inhale, ask for God to fill us with his Holy Spirit. And on the exhale, ask for God to show us what he wants to do next. It's just as simple as that. 2 p.m., pray with us. November 2nd is our charge conference. For those of you not familiar with Methodist, Methodism, ways that we handle everything, charge conference is an annual event where we approve our nominees for board for our annual trustees report, finance report, uh, the pastor's report. We are hosting two other churches, McAllen First and St. Mark's. So members of their leadership and community will be here. Members of our leadership and community will be here. Everybody smile and nod. That's your official invitation to come to Charge Conference. It's great. And we'll share a time of communion together. Our district superintendent presides over that, and she will have devotion to share. So please plan to be here November 2nd as well. And then, last but certainly not least, on November 18th, I'm trying to put all this out here so you have it on your mind and on your radar. It's in the newsletter. It's on the announcement slides. It's everywhere. So you can't say, I didn't know about that. November 18th, we are in partnership with McAllen First and El Buen Pastor hosting a Friendsgiving potluck at Edinburgh Memorial Park, 1212 Sprague um, we keep talking about all the parks in Edinburgh. I cannot tell you which one this really is. It's at 1212 Sprague. Everyone drive out there and take a look. But we've rented the pavilion. We will bring a potluck. We'll invite the community to bring their friends and a dish to share. Uh, we're working on details about maybe how we supplement that. But put it on your radar. It is not a big, crazy event. It's about community coming together, meeting one another in fellowship, and sharing a time together in Thanksgiving before we all go off to do Thanksgiving with our families. So, enough announcements. If you are joining us online, I invite you to begin passing the peace on that thread. Check in. More than good morning or hello, bless one another in the peace and grace of Jesus Christ. If you're joining us here in person, I invite you to take out your smartphone, check in on that thread. 
um, and bless our online community. It's just one small way we have to connect our online and in-person family. And then, if you would, take just a moment to stand and greet each other in the peace and grace of Jesus Christ, whether it's with a handshake or an elbow bump or a hug, if they are willing, no forced hugging, all the introverts to the right. Uh, <laughs> And let's greet each other in the peace and grace of Jesus. So as you make your way back to your seats, I'll ask you to go ahead and remain standing as Laura comes to lead us in the call to worship. Good morning, church. Good morning. If you will respond with a bold, um, I'm going to read first, and then uh, it'll be your turn. Mighty King, lover of justice, you have established fairness. You have acted with justice and righteousness throughout Israel. Exalt the Lord our God. Bow low before his feet, for he is holy. Moses and Aaron were among his priests. Samuel also called on his name. They cried to the Lord for help and he answered them. He spoke to Israel from the pillar of cloud, and they followed the laws and decrees he gave them. O Lord, our God, you answered them. You were a forgiving God to them, but you punished them when they went wrong. Please join us in singing the song of praise. That's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, kindness of a Savior, the hope of nations. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is my. Take me as you find 
remind me all my fears and failures and fill my life again. I give my life to follow everything I believe in. Now I surrender. Say Lord God, we are filled by your spirit, by your presence. And I pray that even now, the words that we have sung mean something more than just a verse, but that we sing for the glory of the risen King, that our hearts are moved into a place of worship, that we haven't come here this morning out of habit, we haven't come here out of selfish need, we have come to humble ourselves between the king, before the King of Kings, that we have come to bow down and lift you up, that you are greater, that we need you, that we love you, that we recognize you as more than a good idea, as more than our moral compass. You are our God and King, our Redeemer, our Savior. You are moving, you are pouring out your spirit, and we are being transformed, and we trust you to lead us in the ways that lead to life eternal. We love you and we bless you, and it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Our scripture this morning comes from the book of Philippians, chapter 4, verses 8 and 9. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. 
Keep putting into practice all you learned and received from me. Everything you heard from me and saw me doing, then the God of peace will be with you. These are the words of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So this is from the book of Philippians written by Paul. And just a little context of this, Paul is in prison. And most likely he is awaiting judgment, either to be released or to be sentenced to death. And he's writing this letter to the church in Philippi. And it is a big sort of deal because the church of Philippi is a Roman city. To live in Philippi is by law at the time to literally be living in Italy. That's how they describe the power of the Roman authority there. They are an honored town in the Roman empire. And so when Paul first went to Philippi and planted this little bitty church that he wasn't there for very long, and then he moves on because that's Paul, he sends letters. And so he is in prison awaiting the determination about whether or not he will live or die. And in the book of Philippians, this imprisoned man tells the church of Philippi more than 13 times to rejoice, have joy. So when we start picking apart the scripture, as I'm about to do, just trust that Paul isn't living in some nice little bubble. Things aren't great for him. He is about to await his future sentence, and he is telling the church of Philippi, find joy. I think what is both comforting and disturbing about uh, this letter and the example of, the, of Philippi is that Part of what instigates this letter is that Paul learns from Epaphroditus, who is one of the Philippians who's been going back and forth to bring needs and supplies to Paul. Because when you're in prison in near ancient Israel in the biblical times, the prison didn't provide for you. The people in your life provided for you. So if you needed food and clothing and all the things that you need when you are in prison— or in your everyday life, the people who love you are responsible for making that happen. And so Epaphroditus is going back and forth, and he's, Epaphroditus is coming, and he's like, things in Philippi are bad. It's bad. There's a lot of infighting. There's no unity. We've got one group of people who think that they know better than everybody else. They have somehow reached this perfection in in understanding Jesus and the law and the things that you said, and they hold themselves above everybody else, and they are oppressing and holding things down and making people feel small and insignificant and unworthy. And they are wrestling because their identity, their whole lives, has been wrapped around the idea of being a Roman citizen the power and the authority that comes from being a citizen of Rome is greater than just being a Jew or being a Gentile or whatever. If you are declared a Roman citizen, you have all kinds of power. And that's part of why Paul is in prison, is that Paul was preaching and they didn't know that Paul was a Roman citizen and they arrested him and they denied him the rights of a Roman citizen. And so now there are some people very uncomfortable with what might happen. Because to do that to a Roman citizen is to invite death. So there's a lot of undercurrent. There is a lot of discord and disunity. And it didn't take a big stretch for me to think about our own denomination and our own culture. We have some people within the context of the Christian church who think they know what they're doing and the rest of us are wrong. Some people within our own families who think they know better than everybody else, that they've got the inside track with God. We find our identity in our nationalism or our ties to our politics instead of as brothers and sisters in Christ. 
And there's always this tension. What matters most? Being a son and daughter of God or my identity in this other thing? Whether it's politics or Rome or being a first or second generation Philippian, all of the things that get tied up into that. And so Paul writes this letter. It's very short. But he keeps telling them over and over throughout the course of this letter how much they are loved, how important they are, how good God is. And he's building this case for them chapter after chapter about what it means to really know the peace of God and to have joy in God. And finally, he says, Finally, you have to let the rest of this stuff go. You can't be constantly divided. Think about these things. Focus your attention on these things. What is true? And we're just going to stop there for a second because he goes on to talk about what's true and pure and lovely and admirable and praiseworthy and all these things. But he starts with something very important. What is true? We understand as Westerners in 2023 that truth is different than facts. Truth is somehow facts revealed in wisdom and discernment and knowledge and the gift of the Holy Spirit and the understanding and our, and our lens. So what is true? He's asking them to look past what they thought their identity was, either as a Roman or a Philippian, their history, their power, their money, their influence. What is the truth? What did you understand? What did you know when I told you about Jesus? That thing that can get clouded and cluttered and silenced. What is true? And from there, if we know the truth, of who Jesus is, that Jesus is our Redeemer and our Savior and the Son of God and the Messiah, the Anointed One, and that he has called us to a life of love and to serve the least and the lost and the broken and to give voice to those who have been silenced and to protect the orphan and the widow. Then we have to be able to not look at someone and see the worst thing they've ever done. We have to get past all the ways we have been broken and divided. We have to choose to see the image of Christ in each other. However that makes us different. However that makes us uncomfortable. What's true, what's honorable, what's noble, what is worthy of praise. I want you to take just a second, and I want you to think about who is it in your life that you are in relationship? I'm not talking about an enemy. I'm talking about somebody that's in your life that there's always like some little bit of friction, some little bit of irritation and annoyance, and it's easier to tune them out and, and pretend they don't exist in your world than to think about what is true and good and noble and praiseworthy about them. To value that more. And we start there because the next thing, according to the biblical mandate of Jesus is that we love our neighbor and we love our enemy. 
So I want you to think about, in your own hypothetical parable, that you are a Samaritan. Ha, ha, ha. That makes us the bad guy, by the way. And you see the person you least want to encounter or help in your whole life laying beaten and bloodied in the middle of the road. And everything in your culture and your history says to walk on by. There is no condemnation turning your eyes away from them. And then what does it mean to look at them and see what is true and what is good and what is admirable and noble and praiseworthy? Because those things exist in them too. They, by their very DNA, are the image of God. They are created by the same God. The person that you've been given by everyone else all permission to walk on by. What does it mean to look for the thing that makes them look like Jesus? And to see that as more important than everything else. I will be honest that I have struggled with this scripture more than just this time, for all the times that I've ever taught it, for all the times that I've ever had it taught to me. Because there is this part of me that thinks, well, isn't that sweet? Isn't that precious? That's so good, some people can do that. And I sort of put on a back burner that Paul's in prison waiting his death sentence when he says it. Because you know, it's Paul. I'm not Paul. That's like when people are like, well, I'm not Jesus. So I'm like, we are supposed to be like Jesus. But nobody said I had to be like Paul. I struggled with it because I'm a real person who has lived a real life in the real world, and people have hurt me. People have done unspeakable things. I have done unspeakable things. And I have given, long given up that those people have any obligation to forgive me have any obligation to look at me as a new creation in Christ. I just sort of trust that to the Lord. But when I'm the one who looks at the mess people have made in and around my life or my family or my work or my whatever, and somebody says, does God love them? It doesn't matter how you feel about them, but does God love them? Do I need God's justice more than God's grace? And have I ever come to the understanding that God's justice is grace? Because that's what's true, and that's what's beautiful, and that's what's admirable and praiseworthy. We had this spectacular conversation on Wednesday um, spurred by a question about forgiveness. And knowing the distinction between forgiveness and a boundary, knowing the difference between surrendering that broken space in us to what God can do in it versus having to be putting ourselves in the place of getting beaten up every day. But then the flip side of that is that even when we hold the boundary, even when we find a way to forgive, even when God moves in us and works on our heart and our spirit and we start to move in that kind of obedience, you can't just write them off and pretend they don't exist. You have to find what is true and what is good and admirable and praiseworthy and pray it into fruition and manifestation in their life by God's Holy Spirit. And one of the questions that, was, that sort of came up in that conversation was, well, do we have to forgive? 
And I immediately said yes, because unforgiveness is a sin. But if I'm going to be totally honest, we don't have to do anything. We have free will. We can choose. But if the point is to be more like Jesus, then it's not really the choice. I mean, it's our choice, but we don't have to do anything because it's our choice. Will you? Will you think about what is true? Will you engage what is good and honorable and right and noble and praiseworthy and lovely? Will you choose to see that instead? And that doesn't mean we blindly go along with everything. It doesn't mean we overlook inhumanity, and it doesn't mean we don't think for ourselves, and it doesn't mean we don't feel the way we feel about politics or the country or our world or all that stuff. We are who we are. We are finite human beings. But what we choose instead at the end of the day, no matter how we feel about whatever we're feeling, is that we are going to look for what is true, and what is true is Jesus Christ. And we are going to look for what is beautiful and admirable and noteworthy and praiseworthy, and that is Jesus Christ. And we are going to believe that the King of Kings, whose will is that none should perish, has complete authority over what's going on, and we are going to lay our heads down at night and rest. So when I worry about the state of Christianity in the world, which is what us overthinkers do, because it's not enough just to lead my own church or figure out what I'm doing as a pastor. i got to worry about everybody and exhaust myself. But when I do that, when I choose in the middle of the night to think about what is true and good and worthy and honorable, I think about things like yesterday when I see our littles working at the food pantry distribution, and I think about, which was really probably, what, 45 minutes to an hour where I walked down the line of cars to pray with people, and Cindy wasn't here, so we didn't have anyone to pray in Spanish, and so I would get to the car, and if they didn't speak English, I apologized for not speaking any Spanish, and the one phrase that got me through was, que Dios los bendiga, but I learned that morning. <laughs> And as the words came out of my mouth, and then I always asked, did I say that right? <laughs> they would reach out and bless me in return. They laid hands on me and prayed for me. And so lessons one and two. One, we need lots more people who are willing to come on Saturday morning to pray. Because you don't have to have perfect words or good words. You just have, need to have true and lovely words. And lesson number two. I said, there is beauty there. And it transforms everything. I'm going to think about that. I'm not going to worry about all the ways the church is broken. I'm going to think about all the ways the church is doing something good. And the more we focus on the way the church does good, the closer we come to fixing the ways the church is broken. The more we think about the way our discipleship is healing the easier it is to fix the way our discipleship is sick. It goes for our community and our church and our country and the people in our families and the people at our jobs and the things and the circumstances and the noise of a culture that clashes and rubs and chafes against what is good and true and honorable and lovely and forgiving and holy. So we come this morning, and I ask you, again, will you, in your heart and your spirit, think about and decide what is true, what is good, what is honorable, what is life-giving, what is a blessing, what is a gift, what is worthy of God's praise, and see it in yourself, see it in each other, and see it in everyone you see. Will you pray with me? Lord God, if we want to move forward, if we want to do the work of the kingdom and build your kingdom, 
and become who we were born to be by your grace, then we have to see this. We have to focus our heart and our energy here. We can't keep making lists of the way people, the ways people are broken and messy and not right. <laughs> the way they've hurt us or the way they've hurt other people or the way they think or the way they're different. Instead, we have to see the way we're the same and find grace for that in-between space. God, we come to love you and to bless you and to be your children and to walk in the ways of life everlasting. And it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Would you join me in our profession of faith, the thing that we know is true? I'll read the leader portion, and then we will all declare the portion printed in bold. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is one true church, apostolic and universal, whose holy faith let us now declare. We believe in God the Father, infinite in wisdom, power, and love, whose mercy is over all his works, and whose will is ever directed to his children's good. We believe in Jesus Christ, Son of God and Son of Man, the gift of the Father's unfailing grace, the ground of our hope, and the promise of our deliverance from sin and death. We believe in the Holy Spirit as the divine presence in our lives whereby we are kept in perpetual remembrance of the truth of Christ and find strength and help in time of need. We believe that this faith should manifest itself in the service of love as set forth in the example of our blessed Lord to the end that the kingdom of God may come upon the earth. Amen. God, may that 
Ooh, may that be true for us as well, that we give ourselves wholly and completely to you, that you would consecrate this life, what we bring to you, and you would use it for your good and for your glory, for the blessing of others, for the healing of others, for the restoration of others. Let us be intentional about the words that come from our mouth, whether we're singing a song or reciting a prayer, that we would mean what we say. That it isn't just going along or participating, it is a sacrifice. It is an honest intention, our gift to you. So God, we confess all the times when our words aren't aligned with our heart and the actions of our hand aren't aligned with your heart. We come as your beloved children to lift members of our community and our family, our friends, to your care. So God, we lift Don and Donna, Ed, Loretta, Scott, and Laura, Ron, Kim, John and Melissa, Irma, and Mary, God, would you meet their every need? Would you heal their broken places? Would you comfort their fears? Would you heal their loneliness? And for those who are victims of violence, Would you bring healing and restoration and justice? God, for those who perpetrate violence, would your kindness lead them to repentance that they too might know you and have a life redeemed To those who struggle, for those who struggle with addiction, God, would you lift them from their oppression? Would you put them on solid ground and put the help they need right in front of them, the right people, the right resources? God, for those who struggle with shame, would your spirit pour over and through them, reminding them in Christ there is no condemnation, God, for those who just feel numb to the world, who are just going through the motions a day at a time, would you give them rest and respite? Would you plant seeds of joy and of hope? For those who struggle with resources, God, would you release the storehouses of heaven and teach us, your sons and daughters, to give all that we have so that none would have need. If you have a joy or a concern, I invite you to use the mentee link so that we can pray with and for one another, that we can carry one another's burdens, and that we can delight in God's provision.
Lord God, for those in our community who struggle with chronic illness, who are tired of having courage, tired of taking the next step, God, we ask that you would revive and renew them, that they would see hope in unexpected places. For those who are looking for just the right place of employment, God, those who are trying to find a way to care for their family, would you knock down every obstacle? Would you narrow every path except the one that is for their best and their good? God, for those who feel forgotten and overlooked, would you, in a way that speaks only to them, remind them that they are beloved? And then even now, as we come in prayer, that you would place a name on our heart. And today, before the sun goes down, we would reach out to that person and let them know that they are loved and cherished and valued and a part of our family. God, for those things we don't know how to pray, the things we don't have words for, we just open ourselves up to you and we invite you in. Search our heart and our spirit. We trust you, God, for you are trustworthy. We love you and we bless you. And it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. And now let us pray as Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not to temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom the power and the glory forever amen now is the time in our service where we worship god by bringing our gifts our tithes and offerings and our sacrifice of praise come let us bless the lord together
Take these gifts, bless them, multiply them, do with them infinitely more than we could dream or imagine. Lord God, we bring you our first and our best of our time, our talent, our giving, and our service. For the good of your kingdom and the glory of your name, in Christ Jesus we pray. Amen.
receive this blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord turn his face to you and give you favor. The Lord lift his face to you and give you his shalom, his peace. Amen. Amen. Thank you.